this session, we invited the CEO of Sony ATV Music Publishing Nashville, Rusty Gaston, to have a conversation with West Coast editor for Billboard, the incomparable Melinda Newman. I'll turn it over to you two to take us inside the world of music publishing. Thanks, James. Thanks, James. How are you doing, Rusty? I'm great. I'm glad we've got the audio and the video working. How exciting this is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a different world though, isn't it? Like, I don't know if everyone could just hear that, like a huge garbage truck just went by my window. <laughs> but at different times, which we will, um, we will definitely address more during uh, our chat here. But I actually wanna just start with one of my favorite things to talk to publishers about is most of us grow up loving music, but we're not really aware of songwriters. Like we hear a song and we just love the song. At what age or when did you become aware that there were actually people writing these songs that possibly weren't the person, that wasn't the person that was singing it, or that these things just didn't appear? That's a great question. I was really lucky at an early age to have like some real defining moments in life. And one of them was, I just, I knew that all I liked to do as a kid was go to the record store, spend all my time in the record store, yeah lay in the floor of my bedroom, listening to music, reading the liner notes. And my father had said to me one day, everyone in this world has a job doing something. And I just pieced together, well, the one thing that I'm good at are the songs that I'm always attracted to are the songs that eventually become popular on the records I liked. So I knew there had to be a job where somebody helped figure out which songs on the record radio. And um, right out of high school, I read an article in the Dallas newspaper about a songwriter named Tom Douglas, and he was having a hit on Colin Ray called Little Rock, and it said, like, he lived right there where I lived, and he wrote this song I was hearing on the radio, and I think that's the first time it really, like, hit me. Oh, my gosh, there are people that do this. This guy lives here, so I tracked Tom Douglas down and cold called him and ended up going over to his house and sitting with him and talking about songs and songwriters. And now, 27 years later, uh, we work together and I'm his publisher. Okay, that's one of the best whole circle moment stories I have ever heard. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Oh my God. And that's, see, that, that's still from an era where there were phone books? Where you, did you just find his name in the phone book? Honestly, yes, and just cold called him up. Yeah, and technology isn't always our friend, I think. I mean, yep. yeah, same thing, where I had 45s, where I would look at and see the songwriters' names. You could find someone in the phone book. Not so easy now. Um, did you, then you came to Belmont, and did you come to Belmont specifically to study in the music program, or what was the thinking with that transition to Nashville? You know, I was going to college in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, at a school called Texas Wesleyan University, and uh, I was a performer at Six Flags Over Texas. So I sang and danced and played guitar, and I had another defining moment there where I remember being on stage, the costume I was wearing, I can see the audience, I can picture the stage exactly like I'm there right now when it just hit me man, I don't want to do this at all. I have zero interest in this. How do I get into the music business? And I saw an interview on TV just after that from Trisha Yearwood, who she said she attended Belmont and she interned at a record label. So I literally asked someone, hey, how do you, what is an intern? Have you ever heard of this? They said, oh, you worked for free to get experience. And I said, I'll do that in a second. Like, how, how do I do that? So I just cold called again, I guess that's the, the common theme of all this, is I cold called the production company that produced my show at Six Flags and said, hey, could I intern in your office? And long story short, that production office had some connections with Sony ATV in Nashville. And there was a publisher at Sony ATV in Nashville who had found a country artist named Rhett Akins at a uh, theme park in San Antonio. And some people from, from Sony ATV came to Dallas to Six Flags to see some performers in our show. And I met those publishers there. And when I met them, I was like, oh my gosh, th this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what it's called. I, I didn't know what it was. 
And one of those publishers, his name was Jerry Smith, and he was leaving Sony and he was starting a company at Warner Chapel. And he told me, he said, hey, I need somebody to help me. If you come to Nashville, maybe you can help me. And I just heard that as an invitation. So I left a full scholarship to college, I left my family. I'm an only child. I broke up with my girlfriend. And on August 17th, 1996, I drove to Nashville and called Jerry Smith up and said, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but you said if you ever, if I came to town, I could help you. So I came to town and I'm here. And uh, he let me start helping him. So I went and I enrolled at Belmont and I took classes in the morning and at night so I could work all during the day. And uh, I finished school at Belmont um, and moved up here to chase it down. So you were interning at Sony ATV? <clears throat> no, I was interning for a guy named Jerry Smith that had a venture with Warner Chapel. For a child. He had just he had just left in the in the, the next few months. He had left Sony ATV <laughs> and uh, he started his own company. Uh, but man, it sounds all kind of like it was pre uh, predestined. It, it was. He were GM of Song Garden Music which is Byron Gallimus yes. Publishing Company. Can you talk about, in case people don't know, in, in Nashville, the role of the independent publisher is really strong. There are really, really strong independent publishers, whether it's Creative Nation, whether it's, you know, Byron's company, whether, you know, the, this, you know, your, your former yep, this company, music. CB now owns. It's a little bit of a different thing than in the pop and um, urban worlds. Can you talk about that? Like how strong independent publishers are in country? Yeah, I think the special thing that's about Nashville is that this is truly a community and a land that is all built on the power of a song. And um, songwriters every day, like the business we do in Nashville is purely um, – speculative, uh, where it is very different in other cities, meaning uh, we see talent, we see songwriters who have nothing going on, and we just feel something inside of ourselves, and our, our the, we get goosebumps on our arms, and we say, oh my gosh, I know this person can write hits, and we sign them, and we champion them, and we encourage them, and we feed them full of of positivity and opportunity and hope uh, and pray that they write the songs that we can take to these artists and take to these labels and take to these producers to get them recorded. And so there's really a, a healthy community of publishers that uh, are, you know, work hand in hand and supportive with uh, songwriters to where in Nashville, um, you know, we basically manage the careers of songwriters. We, we build brands for songwriters. We wave flags for songwriters. You know, in other communities, it may be common for songwriters in L.A. or New York to have a manager. There's not one single songwriter in Nashville, Tennessee that has a manager. They all have publishers because the publishers uh, do work with them every day on the creative side of managing their calendars, uh, waving their flag, building their brand, pitching their songs, yeah. hooking them up with connections. And that's something that is very unique just in Nashville. I think something else that's very unique in Nashville, uh, I went to college in Nashville and learned about this in college, and it still holds the whole idea of an artist putting a song on hold. And it's just a gentleman's agreement. That does not happen in any other format. Um, <laughs> we wish it didn't happen here, but it's, uh, but it does. Yeah, can you can you talk about the, that concept and how that works? Yeah, and I just think everything in life, but especially in, in the music business, it is all about relationships. And it's all about we're all working together to help one another succeed. And so we sign a songwriter. He writes, he, she writes a great song. We take it to a producer, an artist, an A&R executive, and they can say, hey, we would like to hold that for this artist, which means they're going to take our song and hold it up for no money, just off of, of uh, a handshake agreement. And they may hold that song for a week. They may hold it for a year, meaning we cannot give that song to any other artist. We have promised them the first use on it until they make a plan of whether they're going to record it or whether they're not going to record it. 
And that is something very unique to Nashville. Has that changed at all through the years? Or is it still honored? Is it still, has it morphed at all? Um, um, how important singles are now versus, as, versus having a cut on an album? I think it's morphed a little bit, but it's still about relationships and it's all about communication in that labels understand that today more than ever, it's about having singles. And if there is another artist, you know, willing to, who believes maybe this song is a single, I think a lot of labels, you know, they're partners with publishers, they're partners with songwriters. They don't want to keep anybody from uh, generating an income. So if they know they can't move on the song, more times than not, you know, if they don't really have a firm plan in place, they'll, they're likely to give up the song if we have something else that, uh, you know, is really about to go on with it. So it has morphed, but it's really, it's all about relationship and it's about all of us working together and trusting one another. I want to follow up on the, on the changing to a singles world. Uh, Bart Harpison, who runs uh, NSAI, uh, said that he thought Nashville had gone from 4,000 songwriters who were able to make a living just from songwriting to less than 1,000 now. How do you feel like that's probably true? And is there a smaller talent pool simply because it's much harder to make a living as a full-time songwriter now? You know, that's a tough question. Um, Bart's probably a lot more accurate on the numbers than I would be. But I will say, since I've been a publisher here in town since, what, 96? So we're talking 24-ish years. You know, the biggest change has been, uh, you know, used to albums would sell a million copies. An album cut would make a nine-cent royalty. You know, there was there was $90,000 to be made on that song, just being an album cut. And that potential is not there anymore. Um, you really do need to be writing hits, hits that can be played on the radio. Because the other thing about country music is we're still mainly a terrestrial radio driven format, uh, songs played on the radio across the country. And so, um, yes, for those songwriters that, uh, that are incredible craftsmen, but maybe they're not every day writing the, the hits, it, it's been a struggle and it probably has weeded um, some people out or some companies out that uh, just weren't generating the, the singles. You brought up, it's still a terrestrial medium. That's really how country song, how country <clears throat> still find their songs. Streaming has risen though a great deal. Streaming yeah, has. has gone up 21% more than any other genre year to year so far. God bless America. God bless America, indeed. So, <laughs> can you talk about that? How would you rather have, um, are you always going for the single, the radio single, or what, how has the country finally starting to get speed with streaming affected how you do business? For example, is it just simply, if a, if a songwriter gets a song heard, no matter how now, that is still a transaction? Yeah, without a doubt. I, I completely agree. Uh, you know, I'm one of, hey, we want to get as many songs out there as many ways as we possibly can. And the reality is, is that with these new mediums of streaming and Sirius and uh, YouTube and things like that, labels and managers and artists and publishers can find out really quickly these days how reactive a song is. And if a song is really reacting it doesn't matter if it only came out on streaming, if it just came out on YouTube, if it's really reacting, people are going to find it. People are going to share it. It is going to make its way. And eventually it will dominate all across the board. It'll be a hit on Sirius. It'll be a hit at Terrestrial. It'll be a hit on streaming um, when those songs really react. Do you have an example? I know, for example, uh, Gabby Barrett's Goldmine really started much stronger streaming before radio picked it up and then ultimately it went to number one on yeah. uh, on airplay which is all terrestrial radio just the yeah. art and i i do think you know country is seeing a big increase in streaming which is amazing because we want more 
more fans and more ears on country artists because there is simply no other format on the planet better at communicating human emotion down to the core than country music. And, and no matter what type of music listeners prefer, when they hear that real emotional core of country music, everybody relates to it. And, I, you know, I think of an example like uh, there's a country duo on Universal called Maddie and Tay, and they have a top five hit out this week called uh, Die From a Broken Heart. I think the song has maybe been out 70 or 80 weeks, but it first came out, you know, via streaming, uh, made its way to Sirius. It was a number one song at Sirius XM. I could be maybe a year ago, feels like a year ago. And then they started working it to terrestrial radio based on all of those metrics we talked about, based on it was incredibly reacting at on the streaming services. It was incredibly reacting on YouTube. Then it really reacted big on Sirius and all that stuff together combined that now over a year later, we're sitting here and it's a top five hit on terrestrial radio. And you know, knock on wood, it could be a, a, a number one here in the next month. God willing. Um, so you started at Sony ATV in January. What was the biggest transition? You were coming from running an independent um, publishing company that had great success, but certainly not on the scale of Sony ATV and also not on the scale of having a corporate parent in Sony. So what right. has been uh, your adjustment curve like? Um, you know, at the core of it, it's still fully about relationship. It's absolutely about um, championing songwriters, encouraging songwriters, filling them with belief in themselves, uh, marketing, branding songwriters. At the core of it, that's the same. Um, it is a much bigger uh, machine. And than an independent company. And so, you know, really just that in itself is the biggest adjustment. But it's also, it brings so much excitement because uh, at an independent company, we were very blessed to work with some of the town's most talented writers. All of them have uh, transitioned over to Sony with us. Um, it gives us the ability to, you know, I, I told people coming over here, it's really we're only limited by how big we can dream and that is the in the six months that i've been here i know that that is an absolute reality and that is what one of the things john platt and i talked about where he said you know to me before we made this decision he said uh, you've been given a gift you influence a hundred times more songwriters than you could on your own and you have a gift for that and you need to explore it and um that's what's so fun about this every single day so you're about two and a half months into the job and the world shuts down yeah 10 weeks 10 weeks so talk about that transition for you talk about that transition for your staff and then i want to talk about that transition for your songwriters so how hard was it to adapt to having everyone work from home uh, surprisingly, it, it wasn't as difficult as I think any of us would have imagined. Um, I think we quickly learned that the technology that we all have at our fingertips, we, none of us just realized how much. I, I tell people, when I took this job, I kind of mentally took the approach of, okay, I'm going to come in and just just pay attention for a hundred days. Just look and see what's going on, ask questions. Well, we were only here for 70 days and then we went home. And so we worked here for 10 weeks and now we've been at home for 15 weeks. And uh, in that time, there's 20 staff members here in this creative building. And I am so blessed and uh, thankful for um, the kind of, family atmosphere we were able to make so quickly over those 10 weeks. Um, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, I think they probably weren't either of just taking the approach of, hey, we're all, we're a new team together, even though this is a, a, the greatest legacy of country music. 
together and, and run the ship as one. And as we went home, everybody realized we could just about do everything uh, from home. But also there was a time where it, it's kind of like in a, in a moment of, uh, of chaos, it brought all of us together even a little bit closer. It's like if we went through a traumatic experience together. Um, and so it, it made our team, I think, even a little bit stronger. Now we miss each other and there's definitely advantages to being back in the office and we want to be back in the office, but right now there's no plans of that. Um, are you doing Zoom calls? Or are you doing Zoom hours? Like, how are you keeping up morale? Yeah, um, well, the very first day I started here was on a Thursday. And on that exact day, we started our very first, what I'm calling Bourbon Thursday. And I, my, the goal was I wanted every employee in the building to come in my office right here. And I wanted every employee to come in here. I wanted it to be like Thanksgiving at your grandmother's house. The house is a little too small. We're kind of cramped in. Maybe you bump shoulders, but we're all together in one room. And every Thursday at four o'clock, we're going to have this event in my office. And we started the very day I began. And we that day we listened to some brand new masters from a new artist you know we were all excited about uh the next thursday we started inviting some writers over and they just they sat and played us some songs and told us their story so we've kept that up so every single thursday i mean today at four o'clock we're gonna have you know our bourbon thursday happy hour and our whole staff will get together now our creative team we have a call every single morning at 11 o'clock uh, where our, our production guys, they send us a link that came in the night before. And so our creative team listens to those songs as soon as they get the link. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a, a FaceTime call and we go over those songs and we talk about what, what we loved, you know, uh, what opportunities we have for those songs, where we think we should go with them. So... Uh, we're doing that, and then uh, you know, just one-on-one -on -one calls with all the staff every every week. What is your preferred way to listen to songs? So when the demos come in, you know, I've heard a lot of people like to just get in their car and drive because they usually have a sound system in their car. Uh, yeah. Someone else told me he likes to just sit on his back uh, patio and sit bourbon and listen. What is yeah. your preferred way? when a song from like John party comes in, like what is yeah. your, what's your preferred way? To Honestly, for me, it is at my computer, at my desk through great speakers, because I'm one that I get excited about these songs. If a brand, you know, if a writer sends me a brand new song, what they want me to do is fall in love with it and get it out to the world. So I want to listen to it right here where I can immediately come up with ideas and send it to people. Because that's part of the core of this job that makes it so special is, I'm, I mean, I find songs that I love and I go play them for my friends. Well, I maybe can't go and play it for them now, but I can call them, I can text them, I can email them the song right now. So honestly, that's my favorite way to listen because I can immediately do something with it. If it's on my phone, it's too clunky and then it stops playing and just, uh <laughs> have some examples you can give us of songs that you've be big hits um i mean the first one that comes to mind is a song that won acm and cma uh and a grammy song of the year called um i drive your truck it was recorded by lee bryce it was inspired by uh, uh the songwriter connie harrington heard an interview on on NPR about a father putting out flags on graves for Memorial Day. They asked him how he remembered his son. And this father said, I drive his truck. And she, she just happened to jot that down. And I'll never forget the day the songwriters brought me this song and played it, you know, for me, just a work tape recorded on the phone, just a guitar and them singing. And it's just a life changer. Do you have a visceral reaction when you hear a song like that, that you know if you're having that kind of emotional reaction, it's oh, yeah. with other people like do they? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. And that's why I said like, I had this, like, when I was in elementary school, 
I had a, a dis- defining moment and I remember being in the locker room and I was standing on a bench and I was looking down on a group of my buddies and I, we were changing clothes or whatnot. And I remember them singing a Beastie Boys song. And I thought to myself, why are y'all just now singing this? I played this for you guys last school year before we left school last year and you're just now singing it and that moment stuck with me i didn't know what it meant but later on i just i realized as i got to that point of man the songs that i'm always attracted to on the records i discovered were the ones that were eventually became singles and became popular and i think as being a publisher part of that is is the magic and the nuance of look if something you feel something then it's going to make somebody else feel something and i'm a big big believer in that you know because uh what our job is we're we're trying to help producers produce hit records we're trying to help a and r people get promotions we're trying to help managers get songs that sell big tickets and so they're you know i want to bring them something that's going to help their careers move forward and and they want that well if it makes me feel something inside and and come alive then it's going to make other people feel that way and come alive given the choice of signing a singer songwriter and a non-singing songwriter who are you going to go with uh it's it's tough i I don't have a preference over one or the other it's i'm going to go with the one that has for me personally i'm going to go for the one is connected to their emotions and willing and vulnerable enough to pour them out in song and ideally their natural tendency of putting a song together is commercial you know there are people that uh naturally they write commercial music and there are other people that com- that naturally may tend to something that's more poetic or maybe you know in a less commercial vein. I'm going to be more attracted to the ones that are are capable of pouring out that real life human emotion in the most commercial way possible. What's the advice that you give to a new songwriter when they're going into a writing session? Believe you can do it. Uh, 99% of it is walking into the room, believing this could be the day of the battle, and then um, not giving up and grinding it out and fighting it out. Writing songs is really hard. It's, it's incredibly difficult. It's, you know, the thing that's so hard about it is it never gets easier. If you and I were fence builders, at the end of the day, we sweat and get calluses on our hands and we look back and there is a fence that is built that shows the hard work that we've done. A songwriter goes into a room and cries and toils and bleeds and sweats and they leave the room with nothing to show except maybe a recording on their telephone. And, you know, if the gods smile down on it and that song becomes a hit, the reality is, For it to happen again, it's equally as hard. It never gets easier. If you and I are fence builders, we do. We we know how to do it and we know how to do it. We start doing it quicker and maybe we become more efficient at it. But in songwriting, it never gets easier. And that is what breaks their spirits. And that's why when you see songwriters like Uh, Tim Nichols or Craig Wiseman or Bob DiPiro or Tom Douglas, and they have written hits decade after decade after decade after decade. It's so remarkable because every day they wake up and think this could be the day I could do it again. And it never gets easier. And the fact, you know, it goes against human nature. We want to think if we put in those 10,000 hours, it gets easier, but for songwriters, it never gets easier. And, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was interviewing Ashley. 30th number one. He's now gone on to have seven more. I mean, he's just, I think he has more number ones than any songwriter on our charts ever. 
And Probably. even at that stage, he was talking about how he had worked uh, when he first started um, songwriting and come to town. He worked at a box factory, like he literally put together boxes. And with all seriousness, he was saying to me that he knew he could go back to that if he needed to. Now, at this point, he already, like I said, it had 30 number ones and could just live off the royalties the you know for the rest of the life of his life even if he never wrote another song i think that just goes to your point that you don't know when you know neil young talks about always having your antenna up if you're a songwriter like just always have your antenna up uh and when that song comes you leave you could be in the middle of a meal you could be in the middle of something really important you have to honor that you have to yeah. honor the do you think, as someone who is a witness to this process, do you think there's something otherworldly going on? Because these songs come from nowhere. Or where, what, do you, what do you think they come from? Yes, I 100% I believe any hit in any genre is an absolute miracle from God. There are tens of thousands of things that have to come together at the exact perfect time to make this happen. You know, to have a number one at country radio is more difficult than uh, becoming a, a major league baseball player. And it's, there's so many factors that all have to come together. It's completely out of our hands. No one can manipulate it. Um, you know, heads, record labels don't manipulate it. Uh, just a million things have to come together for songs to be hits. And so I do think there is something otherworldly. The other thing I will say is for hit songwriters, you also have to be wired to win by perspiration, not inspiration. You know, in signing songwriters, I'm almost never looking for the most talented. The most talented is my might have a hit, but we're not in the business of a hit. We're in the business of a hit after hit after hit after hit. And, you know, it's people that they're all incredibly, incredibly talented, but it's those ones that every day who win by perspiration and Ashley Gorley is the best example where every day, whether he feels like it, whether he feels good, And he walks into the mine and he picks up his shovel and he digs for another song. And man, there, there, you know, it goes with that saying that the harder you work, the luckier you get. That is true in songwriting as well. And some of it's just got to be muscle memory. Like some it's got to yeah. be like you're flexing that muscle. And if yeah. you're you continue your digging analogy, you may be getting nothing but dirt you know, for months, but at some point, if you just keep digging, maybe you're going to get that little chunk of coal that actually does yep. turn into a diamond. Yep. That's why you never give up and you write another song every day. Uh, we've got some questions coming in, so I'm going to, I've got more for you, but I'm going to ask you some of these from the people who are watching you. Uh, hi, Rusty. I read some advice from an industry professional who suggested that if you record a cover, to reach out to the publishing company who owns it for potential sync and licensing collaboration. Do you have any advice Nashville specifically for that kind of partnership? You don't need permission to cover a song. That's you, you don't need permission to cover a song, but I, what I heard them say is for sync potential. So if, you know, someone had covered a song and made their own recording, um, you know, could you present it to the publisher to let them know that this other recording exists out there for potential sync possibilities? Uh, I've actually never heard of anybody doing that, and it's probably a really good idea. Um, yeah, so I, I, I would maybe encourage them to do that. Yeah, because often I know uh, I work more um, – with your New York office on this than with you, but I know very often you guys will take a song famous or not the person who's famous for recording it, uh, yep. record it so that you have both the master and the, you've got both licenses. Yeah, without a doubt. I just talked to a manager two weeks ago who has an amazing singer who, uh, you know, was transitioning out of a record deal. And I said to him, I said, hey, 
your client is an incredible singer. How about I give you a list of songs and you go record four or five of these and, and we'll work them on the master side and the sync side, but record some of our, you know, most popular songs, whether it's the Beatles or Elvis or, you know, whatever it, you know, they wanted to pick uh, to, they may create something that really works for an advertisement or a sync or something. So I want to just follow up the repeat the last part of Travis's question, which is, do you have any advice on how to reach out to Sony ATV Nashville specifically? Of a, a um, sync, a, a creative here in Nashville um, that is handled out of LA and New York, uh, Sony ATV. So, um, you know, the best way to go about that, I, I'm not really sure I would, uh, reach out to those departments or reach out to, you know, go into things like this, go into uh, events at ASCAP, you know, you'll end up making relationships with these publishers and they'll open up those doors. Um, how has COVID adjusted recording schedules and pitch opportunities? And I want to tie into that a question I had that we didn't get to, just how are your songwriters since they can't really get together, or maybe they are right. now, maybe they feel like they yep. can now, socially distancing. How are they writing now? Via Zoom. Um, when this started, I thought, oh, well, maybe 50% of the writers will write via Zoom, and maybe the rest of them will write 100 percenters. And uh, it quickly became 100% of writers are writing via Zoom. Uh, the positives of that are they can write, you know, from anywhere. And I do believe that after we get out of COVID on the other side of this, I do believe we're still going to see some artists and some songwriters utilizing Zoom to write because they may, you know, an artist may head out on the road and they can hook up on Zoom on the bus and finish the song. Uh, somebody may go on vacation. They can, they may have to leave the write early. They can go home <laughs> that night, get on Zoom and write. I think that will continue. Um, how it's affected recording schedules in Nashville, it's absolutely affected recording schedules without a doubt. Um, they have have been delayed or pushed back or just pushed pause until uh, they can really get back in the studio, you know, because the majority of the artists in Nashville still go into a studio they have a group of musicians. They all sit in the room together. There's engineers and they work together. Uh, that's, that's happening very infrequently. For the few artists that work with more um, track-based producers that build a lot of the tracks themselves and maybe farm out a few pieces, we're seeing some of that recording happen, but there's definitely a, a pause on major labels hopping into the studio with their artists to record more music. But the good news of that is, is that the artists aren't on the road right now. So some of the biggest superstars we work with, they're all writing songs, which this on the other side of COVID, the artists who are really creating and who are really digging into all their feelings of, because look what we're going through right now no one has ever been through. Our parents didn't go through it. Our grandparents didn't go through it. We've never seen it. Our aunts and uncles have never seen it. We're all experiencing this together. Everybody's going through the same feelings and, and fears and anxieties and emotions. And for those artists that are uh, creating right now and digging into those emotions, they're going to come out with something special. And when we get on the other side of this, they're going to be delivering the music that is really reactive, that people are reacting to. Um, I firmly believe that. Um, the second part of that question is how is this affecting pitch opportunities? Are you, are you still pitching knowing that people are going to go back in the studio? Yeah, so we are pitching. We're, you know, I think there was a belief that recording might start back up in July, but I think we're all realizing, oh, wow, there's, uh, this town is not opening up as quick as we are. So, you know, there may be, a little bit of a slowdown of labels, you know, because they they definitely listened a lot. They put a lot of songs on hold, but now I think they're weeding through those and and um, uh, you know just they they don't have a timeline for the recording at the moment. So it, it's slowing down a little bit, but 
I mean, not that much. I know right before I got on this call, three of our creative people were getting on a on a uh, Zoom pitch meeting with uh, a manager, Carrie Edwards, and her artist John Langston, and the head of A and R at Universal, and pitching them songs. It's so it's going on. I do you see more pop and country interactions like meant to be or the that coming? Yeah, I think so. And I, I think there's been a lot of cross genre collaborations during this time of Zoom because, you know, there may be writers that have relationships either overseas or Nashville writers that have relationships in LA or in New York or in Miami or in London. And they don't, they only get to write when they're in those cities. Well, now they already have those relationships. We're seeing those people actually collaborate via Zoom. So that in itself is opening up other uh, new songs and collaborations. What advice do you have for an aspiring songwriter with strength in lyrical writing to get songs heard? But do, does this person need to find someone who can help them with the music and maybe co-write if their strength is lyrical writing? Or what is your advice? Yes, I think that answer is yes. Um, you know, a lyric sheet. Um, Unless you're just, just, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, he has a main collaborator that they're working together like that. So, like, it goes back to your question of should they find somebody that does melody and, and music? Yes, that's what Bernie Toppin does. Which is still just a, a miracle to me. They've never written a song together in a room ever. Yeah. You crazy. know, never. Yep. How important as a songwriter is it to have a presence on social media? And what is the best way to have your original music heard by publishers? Um, I mean, if you're just a songwriter, I, I'm not sure, you know, there's really an advantage. If you're an artist and you're trying to build a fan base, I mean, obviously it's incredibly important and you need to do You know, I I don't really think it's very important. But yeah, to because no one's really necessarily going to be looking for you there unless right. Yeah, they're really on those platforms looking for artists who are building fan bases. Do music publishers only look for producers with hit songs, or at the least placements under their belt, or is it based on talent and good word of mouth? Talent and good word of mouth. Uh, and that's speaking for Nashville, because, again, it goes back to one of the very first things I said. Nashville is a city that is built on speculation. We are oil wildcatters. Um, you know, I met someone like Emily Wiseband at a Belmont songwriter showcase when she was a freshman in, in college. And I ended up. College and then when she was 22, she won her first Grammy. Um, so we're always looking for, you know, and she had nothing going on. I just, I met her at one of her friends, forced her to submit some songs to a showcase and she got picked and I happened to be there that day and I heard something special in her songs. So we're always looking for, you know, just a great attitude, uh, be likable, don't be a jerk and <laughs> be, be nice to be around and make something great. Uh, we're getting ready to wrap up, but I wanted to ask you, you know, we're at a really uh, pivotal time in American history, not just COVID, but with George Floyd, and it's provoked a lot of reaction in Nashville because the country music community is not, um, it's getting better, but it's not known for its diversity. How, <laughs> as someone who is a gatekeeper, uh, how does of uh, looking for writers that are, uh, you know, more diverse slate of writers who are black, who, you know, female writers tend to be doing better in Nashville, but for a fair number of years they weren't. How do you think this sea change that we're seeing in society is going to affect how a country publishing company runs? Um, I think it's just uh, being open to, um, you know, it, it still, it comes back down to creating songs that are incredibly emotional that react to people and react across the board. You know, we're very lucky to work with 
Darius Rucker and uh, Jimmy Allen and um, whether it is people in the LGBTQ community, you know, we have songwriters that, that uh, fall into that. Um, you know, we, we just recently announced we had signed a, a brand new female producer named Karen Kazak. Female producers in Nashville has really been something completely non-existent. Uh, I got the coolest call from a really A-list writer the other day that tomorrow um, Mickey Guyton is releasing a new song. And this songwriter called me and said, hey, man, with all the songs I've had released, I've never had a female producer uh, produce my song. And it's so cool that that's coming out. It's so cool that y'all are championing that and giving her a shot. And, you know, that's a songwriter I'd met several years ago and just loved her production. And she's incredible. So I, I just think people are open to it. And I do think it's in the conversation, but I, I just think now people don't care. They don't care your race, your sex, your gender. Uh, they just want it. Does it touch people? Is it emotional? Does it make me feel anything? And if the answer to that is yes, no one cares who's creating it. Thank you very, very much, Rusty. You got it. Thank you, Melinda. All the writers, keep writing. James ASCAP, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.